So everyone, this program, the Wise Habits series, is a chance for us to showcase the fruits of the intellectual formation we offer here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley, also known as the DSBT. Every friar from the province of the most holy name of Jesus receives his education here. These men are the pastors in our parishes. They run ministries throughout the province and they are professors at our school. Father James Moore is a Californian through and through coming from the small town of Coalinga. He earned his bachelor's degree majoring in music and specializing in organ performance at Santa Clara University. And as an undergraduate, Father James served as organist and sang in the choir at St. Dominic's Church in San Francisco. Father James then earned a master's degree in music at Notre Dame University, again specializing in organ performance and also serving as a graduate assistant organist at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. He then entered the Dominican order in our Western Dominican province in August 2000, earning another master's in philosophy with a thesis on music and morality. In 2008, Father James was ordained to the priesthood and served for two years as a college chaplain at the University of Arizona in Tucson. After a these years in parish ministry, Father James went to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. to begin a doctorate in religious and sacred music. At this time, Father James served as director of the Scola Cantorum, a choir of Dominican seminarians and priests at the Dominican House of Studies, producing two CDs of choral music. He continues to serve on the liturgical committee for the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, DC. Father James was appointed Vicar Provincial for Advancement for the Western Dominican province, which basically means he raises money for the province to fulfill its important mission for the salvation of souls. I have known Father James since before he entered the order going back to 1996 and have studied with him and worked with him ever since he entered the province. Now there will be a time at the end of Father James presentation for questions. And if you have a question during the talk, you can write the question in the chat box in Zoom. The title of Father James presentation this evening is Sacred Music and Preaching the Word, Evangelization in Worlds Old and New. We are very pleased to welcome Father James this evening, and I now turn the microphone over to you, Father James. Thank you, Father Peter. And as Father Peter mentioned, you know, I, we've had a, a number of years actually of doing collaborations together, right? Father Peter, I mean, back to the time yes. uh, when I was a novice, and Father Peter actually is musical as well, little spoiler alert there. <laughs> but Father Peter uh, was often the cantor and I was the organist for a lot of big liturgies. And so yes. it's a, a real joy to be uh, doing some musical stuff with you all tonight uh, and uh, sharing this great love that I have of sacred music. Um, you know, brothers and sisters, I, I really wanted to focus on music and evangelization tonight, uh, and particularly the role that art and beauty play in evangelization. Uh, you know, we, we come from, a, 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 we live in a difficult time as Catholics. We, we live in a time when a lot of people have forgotten about God and the church herself has done uh, sometimes a okay job, sometimes not so great job of keeping her members in the fold. Uh, Bishop Robert Barron, probably one of the best evangelists of our time, recently said, nobody was ever argued. I mean, sorry, nobody was ever hugged into atheism, right? Nobody was ever hugged into atheism. They were argued into atheism. And he said it just bothered him so much that we offered them banners and balloons where other people are for your arguments. He said, no, Christianity should offer love, should offer beauty, and it should also offer an argument. So uh, the DSPT will certainly give you plenty of arguments as to why we should be Catholics, as to why we should be Christians. Uh, but also uh, the DSPT, especially when we study uh, the arts, I was privileged to study under the late uh, Father Michael Morris, and uh, whenever we, we, we think about the arts uh, in our Catholic world, we should see that there's also that warmth and love of God that comes through beauty. 
and that beauty is ultimately connected with truth. And so it gives me great honor tonight to sort of delve into this topic. Uh, and it's gonna be a night, um, my apologies, I know there are a few musicologists out there uh, who are professionals. Um, it's gonna be a night of a lot of generalities. These are what at uh, the undergraduate level, undergraduate level would be a semester long course. At the graduate level would be four semesters long that I'm compressing into one little talk tonight. So it's gonna be fast and it's gonna have some music but, uh, and we probably won't be able to hear all of the music, but if you'd like, uh, what we can do is we can do a follow-up email with you at the end, and I can give you links. I can just give you the text of my presentation with links to all the music and more. So you can hear uh, all sorts of sacred music and really, hopefully, the point of this is to enrich your faith. Uh, my faith personally has been enriched uh, by sacred music. I mean, when I was 13, my uh, decision to be a Christian, sort of my adult decision to be a Christian, happened in the midst of a service of Anglican Evensong, actually, which is uh, the Episcopalian version of Vespers uh, at Grace Cathedral, where I just realized through beauty, the Holy Spirit really touched me in realizing all this is true. So brothers and sisters, let's start at the very beginning, and we're going to leapfrog through a lot of things tonight here very quickly. We're going to start off uh, with the Last Supper. And remember, at the Last Supper, Jesus sang a hymn, right? That night that he was betrayed, the night of his passion, he and his disciples, when they went from the upper room over to the Mount of Olives across the Kindred Valley, sang a hymn. And as we read from the fathers of the church, especially with St. Augustine, uh, we read about how the hymns of the church moved him. We think about early hymnists, such as St. Ambrose. We think of great liturgical writers, such as St. Ephraim the Syrian, we think of all St. Romanus the Melodist in the East. There are many, many great writers, but there's a problem with early music. We don't know how to read notation of early music. There's very little notation that's there, and the little notation that is there, we can't read, at least not definitively. There's a lot of controversy on that, by the way. I'm not going to get into any of that tonight. But Long story short, basically we think that sacred music was pretty much an aural tradition that is passed down by ear and by tradition and custom until around the year 800, when all of a sudden we get music that we can read and notation that we can read. Uh, so, and out of this early part of the church, at least for the first 1,000 years, the most important music to come out of it is chant. Now this chant we often refer to as Gregorian chant, right, coming from Pope Gregory the Great. Pope Gregory the Great lived about 200 years before any sort of readable notation. But he certainly uh, did uh, encourage singing. He himself came from a monastic tradition. And he uh, also promoted the Schola Cantorum there in Rome. We don't know exactly where chant came from, Christian chant, uh, Gregorian chant. But we do know that it comes out of the mists of Christian contemplation. So other music might have secular equivalents and things like this, but Gregorian chant itself definitely definitively coming out of the com contemplation of the early church and especially her liturgies and especially her liturgies on the word of God. So when we think about the, the monks, right, in these great monasteries, chanting the Psalms of David, right, which is the music that comes out of the ancient Israelite people coming out of the Old Testament, the Bible's own hymnal, the Psalter. And Catholic religious still sing that today. Now, like I said, coming out of the midst of time and brothers and sisters, Gregorian chant really has never gone away. In fact, if you ever read the liturgical documents of Vatican II, they extol the virtues of Gregorian chant. And I have to say, some people might think, well, I don't hear a lot of chant today. Let me tell you though, I hear a lot more chant today than I did when I was a little kid. And let me tell you, there was a lot more chant when I was a little kid than there was at the end of the 19th century, actually. So chant has ebbed and flowed in its popularity in the church, but it's never gone away, and it's always been an official part of the church's history and the church's music. So we're going to begin tonight with a piece of Gregorian chant. So uh, we hope that this all this technology works out well. And here is a piece of Gregorian chant. This is Ubi Caritas the uh, translation of this very, very simple chant for Holy Thursday evening, where charity and love are true or are found, God is there. And what a needed message, especially in today's cold and sad world, that message of ubi caritas, 
So here we go. We're going to share the screen and hope that this all works. Here we go. We're now sharing the screen. So Ubi Caritas at Amor Deus EBS. And I'm sharing you the screen so that you can actually even see the notes, the Gregorian chant notation, and you can also see the text. <laughs> about Gregorian chant, so we don't have a lot of time to listen to all the things. But with Gregorian chant, you have what? You have this great music, again, born out of Christian contemplation, where you can hear the words sung, right? You can hear the words sung, and it's easy to hear, but it's also, it's contemplative. And it's a little bit hard to get into if you're not used to it. Uh, I heard one old Dominican priest once say to me, he said, brother, he said, Gregorian chant is not about just a work of art. He said, it's a way of life. Not just a work of art, but a way of life. It calls us to slow down from our hectic and crazy world and to enter into contemplation. And it's hard to do. You got to work at Gregorian chant. You can't just be like, oh, here we go. I'm going to, oh, instant gratification. No, it requires stopping contemplation. And to be honest with you, it took me about a year or two of doing chant a lot, like almost every day and certainly every week before I really understood the aesthetic of getting into chant. Now keep that melody uh, in your mind that we just heard the, uh, the Ubi Caritas because we will use this later on when we get into uh, later works. Now, we're gonna skip ahead about 200 years to the first entrance of quote unquote harmony. And this is a Christmas piece. Uh, this is called Viderunt Omnes. And so what would happen would be then uh, the earliest harmony is that you would have composers who would take, um, they would take the chant and they would put it into long notes. So like, Ubi caritas, ooh, just that first note, and then put a lot of other notes above it, ooh, 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 or other notes, just all, all sorts of weird notes on top of it. And then they would have the next note with a lot of notes on top of that. And th so it would be this kind of florid thing with this chant in very, very slow no notation. So this next piece is Viderunt Omnes, which is a piece again for Christmas Day. It's a chant for Christmas Day, and it's written by the great composer of Notre Dame, Leonin, who was composed around the year 1000. So again, harmony entering into Western music around the year 1000. So here we go. Here we go. So we don't own this. <laughs> So again, really, really wonderful work. This excellent uh, 
ancient work of organum that we hear uh, in the early church here, uh, which is the, those long notes of the chant, and then with these sort of florid descant line above. So again, expanding the word of God, right? And, and really bringing the word of God to people, but not necessarily the text, right? You, it's hard to know, unless you have the printed text in front of you, there, omnis, or me saying it to you over the Zoom, you're not going to hear it all the time, right? So a problem with those words, right? Now, as this, keep this in mind because this becomes important as we move closer to the Protestant Reformation. Skipping ahead 3,000 years later from, uh, uh, sorry, 300 years later from Leonin, we come to Guillaume de Machaut. So this again is a sort of Francophone lands. And this is a setting of the Gloria in Excelsis from the Mass. Again, so sacred music. Now, you're going to hear a lot more dense harmony, but not necessarily the harmony that you're going to be used to. You might think, this harmony is a little bit strange. This is old music. I never knew that old music had weird harmonies. Well, buckle up. Here we go. Gloria. Gloria in excelsis music that we would see just on our day-to-day -day appearance coming to church, and this harmony is a little bit discordant sounding. Uh, this is a time called the Ars Nova, and in this time, the putting together of musical harmonies was kind of a more academic kind of exercise. Not necessarily something that would be meant to excite the listener when he came in, or at least not the way that we think of exciting the listener nowadays. We're going to have to skip ahead really fast. Remember that Leonine strange organ that was very florid, very beautiful. One of the big problems there, you can't understand the words very well, right? Viderunt omnes. Okay, we get around to the year 1500 and what shows up? The Protestant Reformation. What does the Protestant Reformation like to focus on? The word, right? The word. And there's a stress that in the Catholic Church, we're not proclaiming the word. Now, if you know the old liturgy, it's got tons of word, right? It's got ton of the word in it. At the same time, the old liturgy, though, often would have that word hidden in other sorts of ceremonial types of things. So people were worried about, what is this word like? Is, are we going to be able to hear or understand the word? And so uh, the Catholic response to this came the, in a, two waves. The first wave was at the Council of Trent, right? And so the Council of Trent emphasizes the word, that the word is one of the most important things to be done, and the word should be understood in the liturgy, and music should make that word more understood. And so the most famous composer of the uh, Renaissance was a band by the name of Palestrina, and he, more than probably anyone else, really does in, uh, imbibe this sort of spirit of the Council of Trent, how things were to be especially with regard to the word. So here we go, we're gonna share the screen again. And we are going to hear some Palestrina. So this is the Misa Eterni, Misa Eterni Christi Munera, Mass of the Eternal Gifts of Christ the King. And as you can see in here, you'll be able to hear the Gloria really well. We just heard a medieval Gloria a few hundred years earlier. Again, compare the two. When you think of the one 200 years earlier, the music, Mm, it was beautiful, but it was a different kind of more introspective beauty. This is, hello, Gloria, glory to God in the highest. Here we go, Palestrina, the easy to understand Gloria of the words and as well as the exuberance of the music. Again, meant to move the heart and mind to God.
I could listen to Palestrina all day. Unfortunately, we don't have all night. But Palestrina is this really first wave of uh, counter-reformation uh, composers. The Catholic Church's sort of answer to Protestantism. But the church also had a second answer from within, and especially in the dissident church. So the church going underground in places like England. In England, uh, the church, of course, uh, the, the Anglican church, which was the official state church, had a tradition of great sacred music, as did the Lutherans over in Germany. But the Catholic church was still alive in England, although driven underground. But one of its greatest composers from the Renaissance remained a Catholic. His name was William Byrd. And William Byrd took to heart those uh, maxims of the Council of Trent, especially to make the word visible and to even portray the word in sort of dramatic fashion. And so William Byrd uh, actually set all of the propers, all the entire Roman gradual to polyphony, that is, made a little choral setting of all of them. And uh, this is uh, really, really an incredible work, and it's meant for the underground church in England. Uh, we're about to hear a piece called Terra Tremuit. It's very, very short. Now, Terra Tremuit, uh, the, the words of Terra Tremuit say, you know, the earth shuddered and all was still when God arose for judgment. And so that's a sort of very dramatic text, right? Those of us in California understand about Terra Tremuit, right? And whenever we have an earthquake. And so listen to now Terra Tremuit. Now, these are going to be Dominicans singing. This is our Dominican choir from Washington, D.C., this is yours truly directing. And so let's uh, make sure this works. Terra Tremuit, here we go. And again, so remember Terra Tremuit and listen to this very, very short piece about the Tremuit, about the shaking. <laughs> Wonderful music. I love that stuff. Can't get enough of it. So as we move along here, there's a second wave of Christian, uh, of Catholic sort of reaction to the Protestant movements. And these come through, namely, this movement called Christian optimism. New religious orders spring up in the Renaissance, the Jesuits themselves, for instance, and also the oratorians, from where we get the word oratory, which is sort of a, a, a uh, we get the word oratorio, right? And we're all familiar with Messiah, one of the greatest examples of oratorio. In this second wave, the Catholic Church decides that it's going to do something glorious, right? It's going to show the glory of the church and the glory of her liturgy to help win back those who have gone over to Protestantism. Protestantism oftentimes is more staid, right? We think of Calvinism, not these kind of exuberant liturgies. And the Catholic Church instead responds by saying, we can be the most exuberant of all time. So what I'm going to pray for you next is just the beginning of a piece called um, uh, Deus, uh, this is the beginning of the Vespers of 1610 by Claudio Monteverdi. Monteverdi was a composer in Venice. He was one of the first composers of opera. And he also wrote great sacred music including a wonderful Vespers. This Vespers is based on Gregorian chant. Remember I said chant never really goes away? Well, it doesn't. And so here we go. This is, um, this is now a, the beginning of the Vespers service. The beginning of the Vespers service begins as all of the Liturgy of the Hours always does to the Catholic Church. Oh God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. In chant, we would sing, Deus in adjutorium meum intende, Domine ad adjuvandum me festina, Gloria Patria et Filia, etc. Watch what Monteverdi does with that very, very simple chant on one note, right? Domine adjuvandum me festina, Gloria Patria et Filio et Spiritui Santo. 
with those very, very simple few notes, he rocks the world. And you see, here is Catholicism, right? All right, here we go. Vespers of 1610. Let's try to get this right. Here we go. Sorry. Here we go. Here's the priest. I never heard a priest sing like that. Catholicism on steroids, right? Just over-the-top exuberance and glory. Here is the glory of the Catholic Church, the one true church, right? Hard to, uh, it's hard to sort of argue with it when you have something so beautiful. Again, for the evangelization and the encouragement of the faithful. Now, at this time, at the beginning of the, actually during the Reformation, something else was going on on the other side of the world. The the European powers discovered the quote unquote new world. And what have they also discovered there? People. And they discovered people there who, as Pope Francis says, were worthy by their dignity of human persons to receive the gospel. And so with, along with Spanish and Portuguese uh, came Catholic priests eager to spread the gospel. And they also realized that one of the keys to spreading the gospel was beauty. So they've embarked on this massive construction project of building missions, right? Building missions to help convert the natives, but also to build cathedrals and stuff like this in these new cities in the new world, quote unquote, new cities. And the king of Spain realized that beauty would help. Beauty would help convert people. Now, of course, we know the greatest help for conversion was the Blessed Mother. She herself appeared, right, at Guadalupe and Tepeyac. And so there's all sorts of music devoted to her. But the king of Spain knew also that in the, to, 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 we really needed to entice musicians to come to the new world. So we gave massive tax breaks for musicians to come and help found choir schools in the new world. So within 50 years of the conquest of Mexico, there was a choir school at every major city with every major cathedral, filling it with beautiful new music and also training new composers, composers that were writing with a kind of a mixed style of European and native languages. So uh, we're about to hear um, one of uh, these pieces. This is a composer born in Mexico, but he's born during the Mexican Baroque. So again, skipping ahead about 100, 150 years, Manuel de Sumaya. Manuel de Sumaya was the organist and choir master of the cathedral in Mexico City during the time of St. Junipero Serra. Any of my friends from COA who might be watching know what I'm gonna play next because we've sung it a lot of times. 
and we also sang this for the canonization of St. Junipero Serra uh, on the lawn of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception by Pope Francis in the fall of 2015. This piece is called Abritias Mortales, and it's written in praise of our Blessed Mother. And this performance is by Chanticleer, which is a, um, which is a, a group right here in our very own San Francisco. So uh, let's bring up Abritias Mortales. Again, for the Blessed Mother, we've got an ad. Sorry, Google ad's gonna come on here in a second. Let's skip that. There we go. <laughs> Now you'll notice something, brothers and sisters, about that music. You need to go listen. If you've never heard Albricias Mortales, you need to hear it. It's one of the greatest examples of the Mexican Baroque. Now you'll notice something. This is sacred music in Spanish, right? Latin liturgy. Why is this in Spanish? There were some liturgies that were allowed to be in the vernacular before Vatican II, namely, especially the office of the little, uh, the, the little office of the Blessed Mother, right? The little office of the Blessed Mother. And the little matins of that office of the Blessed Mother is called mañanitas in Spanish, right? Which we still have the tradition of today, where on the Feast of Our Lady Guadalupe, if you're like me, coming from a Hispanic, mainly Hispanic part of California, we get up super early in the morning on the Feast of Our Blessed Mother, and we sing to her, right? It's from that tradition of the little matins. So this is a responsory from that little matins office of the Blessed Mother, way long ago, in Spanish. So again, vernacular music could be used especially for evangelical purposes. Again, not strictly always liturgical, but maybe for some of these other kinds of liturgies, like the little office. I want to pray one more piece from the quote-unquote new world. Uh, this is coming from, uh, actually, this is coming from uh, Mission Santa Clara is where this is found. So Santa Clara, if there are any Broncos out there listening tonight, uh, this manuscript was actually found in uh, the mission archives there and is in the De Sase Museum. And it is uh, a piece in honor of St. Joseph. So very, very, very especially appropriate for this time of the year and these days because we are in the midst of a holy year to St. Joseph where Pope Francis has granted us lots of indulgences uh, for devotion to St. Joseph. And of course, for St. Saint, um, Joseph is really one of the biggest uh, 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 themes of St. Francis's pontificate, at least in terms of his devotion. Pope Francis added St. Joseph's name to the Eucharistic prayer for all the Eucharistic prayers and also proclaimed this year of St. Joseph. So this is a piece called Para Dar Luz Immortal, and it's a devotional piece for St. Joseph, and it is sung by the a group again, Chanticleer, and it is um, uh, performed at the cathedral here, the cathedral of, uh, sorry, not the cathedral. This is, it, it, it is shared, uh, it, it is performed at Mission San Juan Batista, which is just south of Santa Clara and north of Monterey. So here we go. We have now the Para Dar Luz Immortal. <laughs> Yeah, boys. 
watching that piece again all night too. Unfortunately, we don't have all night, but this piece, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, it is, now, one thing you also notice in that last recording, beautiful church building too, right? Not just beautiful music, beautiful churches, churches that actually inspire, churches that inspire conversion, churches that speak and, and preach in their architecture. Not only that, an orchestra. So not only were they teaching choral music, but they were teaching instrumental music as well. Also, it's easier to carry stringed instruments than it is to carry a pipe organ over land, right? And so pipe organs tended to come later when industry was a little bit more settled, when there were metal workers, things like that. But at the beginning, these stringed instruments accompanied even in faraway places like California. And for this music to be used here was, is really a joy. And to know that right from the beginning here of the preaching of the gospel in our golden state, uh, great sacred music was used. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we have to skip ahead to our final point here. Moving ahead to the 20th century. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about this um, notion of the chant ne never really goes away. And it's certainly true, but there were times that chant kind of went underground or was not used that much. Um, if you remember at the, uh, when I played for you um, that piece from the Monteverdi, Deus in Agitorium Meum, that was using chant, but it was chant like connected with opera, right? And what had happened was the music of the Catholic Church became more and more and more operatic, oftentimes basically kind of confused with the secular music of the day, right? And so when it became more and more operatic, eventually Pope St. Pius X decided, this is the beginning of the 20th century, that there needed to be a correction. And the correction needed to call people back to this utter simplicity of the beginning of sacred music of chant and what is sacred music. So he issued an edict in 1903 called Tra le Solicitudini. And from that began a massive chant revival. But not only chant, also new music based on chant. So if you remember back at the beginning of the lecture when I talked about that chant, Ubi Caritas. Ubi Caritas et amor. Deus CBS. Well, now we have Ubi Caritas again with the chant, 20th century harmony and utter beauty. This comes from one of the greatest composers of the 20th century, he wrote very little music, unfortunately. His name was Maurice Durefle. And he was a very, very devout Catholic. All of his choral music, with the exception of one piece, is based on Gregorian chant. And it takes the chant very seriously. Here we go. The same Ubi Caritas now clothed with exquisite 20th century harmony. <laughs>
All right. I'm sorry. I've gone a little bit over our time that we had allotted, but uh, I definitely will leave some time for questions. But just sort of to sum up, brothers and sisters, um, you know, really, from the beginning, uh, my, my main point of this whole lecture is that Christianity sought to clothe her worship with beauty, for beauty, for the praise and worship of God, but also to convey the truth of the faith to others. And we continue to do so today. The church is a living and breathing thing, and we ought to continue to try, as we try to evangelize the culture today, to offer arguments, to also offer beauty, to offer beauty and wonderful things. Sometimes it might be a very, very simple song that might draw somebody in, but sometimes it might be that exquisite beauty. And so to provide the very, very best we can for all peoples, uh, for peoples near and far, knowing what the same um, missionaries did so many years ago when they came to California, when they came to the new world, and knowing that the mission field is still ripe today. So before we close tonight, we've got about, uh, I guess about 15 minutes for questions. So sorry, I ran over a little bit, but um, uh, we've got our moderator for questions, Mr. Brian Fegley, my good buddy. Uh, Brian, you got some questions to feed me here? I do. Uh, thank you, Father James. Um, we have a question from Kareem in New York City. Uh, do you have a favorite composer or period in classical music? And if so, why? Uh, I, I think that's impossible to answer because the problem is I, I listen to other pieces and I get more and more excited and I, I listen to something else and it's brand new and I, that's great. And, uh, you know, um, This is, uh, so I, yeah, I don't have a favorite period. That, that's, uh, but I do have to say this, I have a favorite style. When people use chant, it's always intriguing to me. And I think that that's something that excites me, especially when chant is used in a, in a new and exciting way. That always has intrigued me. That being said though, I still like a lot of other music that has nothing to do with chant. And, um, but uh, anytime a composer uses chant, that's why I like this last guy we played Duraflay so much. Uh, another question here. What recommendations do you have for young parents who want to introduce their children to sacred music? Okay, so one of the things you've got is um, for young parents, right? You've got uh, the internet at your disposal, right? So all the things are there. One of the things my dad, okay, I grew up in a small town, right? I did not have great choirs around me and stuff like this growing up. So what we would do were a couple things. First of all, my dad made sure that good recordings were always on, right? And so I remember uh, on uh, the first Sunday of Advent, what would we be playing? Sleeper's Wake, right? The Bach Cantata, Sleeper's Wake, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, getting ready for Christmas. See all these great recordings of the sacred music. These were on LP records, right? And so we'd hear those. But then we traveled. And dad wanted to make sure, especially my mom and dad wanted to make sure that we knew that Catholicism was way more than just our own local parish, right? So, uh, and of course, we had a Sunday obligation, and but our parents used it anytime we traveled to go to a really, really beautiful uh, liturgy. So anytime we were on vacation, anytime we were traveling, my dad, this before the internet, would look ahead and say, where is a really cool liturgy in one of these big cities we were going to, right? Where is there a great choir? Where is there a great tradition? And we'd go there, right? We went, to, I remember as a kid going to the Basilica and the National Shrine in Washington, D.C., hearing what is one of the greatest choirs in America. I remember going to Grace Cathedral, the Episcopal Cathedral here uh, as a kid. I remember um, going to St. Mary's Cathedral here in San Francisco, going to the old Los Angeles Cathedral, St. Viviana's, as a real little kid, and actually hearing the choir from Salem there. I mean, so plan, you got to work at it. That's what I'm saying. You got to work at it and plan out your time, especially if you've got a parish or a church near you that has a great music program, get those kids involved with it. I mean, I know people who live in Salt Lake City. Get those kids in, enrolled in the, in, you know, in the Madeline Choir School there. But if you live in a small town or in a kind of backwater place like I did growing up, and I, I, I own it, I love my hometown, um, just figure it out. I mean, yeah, get, make sure that you just get to as many beautiful liturgies as you can, as well as, you know, playing recordings. Philip says, uh, I love the rich tradition of the church but it seems like it's been lost since Vatican II with hymns in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. Any comments on this? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, if you study the history of sacred music, uh, first of all, hymns in the vernacular were there a long, 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 long time before uh, Vatican II, including really schlocky and junky hymns before uh, Vatican II. So just because something is old doesn't mean it was necessarily good or part of, a good part of the tradition. Uh, I skirted around some of that stuff tonight just because 
some of it's not great. So um, I don't think actually that um, it's all been lost uh, since Vatican II. In fact, um, in at least in the United States, we've never had better church choirs. Uh, certainly, um, if you look at, a, uh, especially at our cathedrals, um, they're, they're promoting better music than they ever have uh, right now. Now, that being said, a lot of the beauty and the sort of solemnity that was associated with the old mass certainly was lost, I think. And so uh, that's a difficult thing to sort of recover. But it's important to remember that, you know, I mean, my mom grew up, grew up in the old tradition. And she said it was pretty rough a lot of times. They would try to do Mass of the Angels, a Gregorian chant Mass would attempt, but not necessarily any great stuff. So I, I think it's important just to kind of keep that in perspective that, yes, I think we've lost a lot of solemnity and we need to work to get some of that stuff back. But at the same time, there are places now that have been, that are doing better music, church music than ever has been done before. So I think that you need to kind of look at it in a balanced way and find a church that has great music, whether it be the old mass. And sometimes you can't find anything else other than the old mass, right? That was the case in one town I was in. I, I really couldn't find any other sacred music other than that. But in a lot of places you have both. And so uh, look around, hunt around, see what you get. Emma asks. By the uh, way, by the way has, I, I do celebrate the old, the, the traditional Latin Mass too. I'm not, I'm not trying to disparage that. I, I have a great love for it and for that tradition. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Emma asks: Has the Church historically taken a position on religious music by Protestant or other non-Catholic composers in terms of its use at Mass and so forth? And does it have a position on that issue today? Yeah, she does. So here's the thing: um, that is not necessarily always by composer, but what it's more is the theology that is proclaimed. So for instance, um, pieces that have been able, able to graft on really early. I mean, a lot of our texts that we share with the Lutherans actually um, are from the same source. A lot of the times the Lutherans will actually redo Catholic hymns and present them. And so it's a Protestant composer, but it's Catholic theology. It's great stuff. Same thing with the Anglicans. I mean, you had um, somebody like William Byrd, who was writing music for the Anglicans and writing music for the Catholics. Um, and we certainly have done, we've seen somebody like Herbert Howells, who was a composer mainly for the Anglicans, who in the beginning of the 20th century wrote great music for the Catholic Church, too. But it's more in the theology of the text. And this is where recently the USCCB, I think, no, yes, it was USCCB put out a notice about this. Uh, there's a com communion hymn, I use that term loosely, called Look Beyond the Bread You Eat, See Your Savior and Lord, Look Beyond the Wine You Drink, See Your Blood for Him Out Poured. I'm like, that's great Lutheran theology. That is not Catholic Eucharistic theology. So especially in hymns around the Eucharist is when you have to really sort of watch the words and say like, is this really portraying Catholic theology? And it's not just Eucharistic stuff. There are other things too. But pay attention, especially I would say to texts. And that's when a good musician, a good church music director can really say, you know, this is, we shouldn't use this. Uh, here's a lighter question. Uh, what are singers doing to stay in vocal shape during COVID? Oh, that's a really sad part. You know, one of the greatest issues of, um, you know, we talk about the industries that are hurting. If you're a professional musician and you make your life singing, if there are any of you on the line tonight from Washington, D.C., um, I know a lot of you uh, just have been sort of hanging on. Uh, and so what a lot of people have been doing, like I know, in uh, here in, um, in St. Dominic's in San Francisco, there's actually a specially developed mask for a choir person. It was developed by Broadway people and it's built with sort of a broadcasting, it's not an electric thing, but it's, it's built so that your lips aren't up against fabric. And it has like kind of a broadcasting like mechanism on the inside of it, the way that it's built architecturally. And it looks kind of like a duck bill, but if you Google Broadway mask, you'll get these things to come up. So I know that here in St. Dominic's in San Francisco, uh, we've been having, um, hmm. I know that some governors have said we shouldn't have sacred music right now. That's very interesting that they have authority over liturgical stuff. But uh, anyway, uh, we want to keep people, I don't want to get into that argument. But I know that some people have been using to keep safe uh, these kind of duckbill masks, and they've been having smaller groups, more spaced out. I know in Washington, D.C., the Basilica Choir in that big church is having people like about 12, 15 feet apart, again, with these special masks. But it's hard. And I look forward to the day when that's one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to at the end of this COVID thing. Another question, why is early notation, uh, why are we unable to read it and what does it look like? Um, okay, so first of all, there's very little of it. 
Um, it looks like kind of hieroglyphics is the best way. I don't have a picture of it ready to show you. Um, and we just, there's no Rosetta Stone. And like I said, there's so little of it. There's so little of it until about the year 800. And what happened was the way that notation began was instead of, well, now we think of like notes on a staff. So we think of a bunch of little lines and like dots running up and down. What they did was they had little signs that would tell you like jump up a third. They would be like memory devices. So it was kind of a hybrid system of memory and notation at the beginning. And then eventually they put a line, they put notes above and below, then they put two, three lines and they put multiple lines and notation sort of uh, developed. Mark asks, how did the Jesuits come to dominate contemporary liturgical music from the 70s? Recording contracts? I don't know. I mean, th they got out in front of it. Um, uh, they were popular. They wrote catchy tunes. There are all sorts of things. Um, Jesuits are notoriously, uh, they, they would say this themselves. Uh, I went to Santa Clara and the, the jokes that the Jesuits would tell on themselves, one of the most famous ones was, remember, you're as lost as a Jesuit in the liturgies of Holy Week. That was uh, as lost as you were. So Jesuits notoriously are not known for their liturgy. They're known for their teaching. They're known for other things. But for them, the liturgy was something they did, not necessarily something that they... Now, there were Jesuit composers, and in the Jesuit missions, they did have some really great music. Um, so just historically, it's kind of funny, yeah, that they got in, in front of the liturgy stuff. There are just a lot of them, too. And they also... Oh, the other thing. They run universities, right? So you send your kid off to Catholic school... He comes back in 1969 with all these new tunes, wants to do them at his local parish, right? I mean, again, if Jesuit University is very influential. So I, that's just sort of my off-the-cuff answer. So this is a long question, but I'll try to summarize it. Um, how do we distinguish sacred music, properly speaking, from secular styles which might lapse into decadence? Or in other words... Can we say that operatic masses, such as those from Monteverdi or Mozart, um, to constitute derogations from the ideal of sacred music? That's a complicated question, but uh, let me try to take a stab at it. First of all, that was an office, uh, not, not a mass by Monteverdi. Um, the masses by Monteverdi actually are quite more conservative. They sound like Palestrina, for lack of a better term, conservative. Um, operatic stuff, though, does develop later on, certainly in the operatic tradition, shifts into uh, the church's sacred music tradition. And, and so much so that you have composers like Verdi writing an, a requiem mass, uh, which, as far as I know, has never been used at an actual requiem mass, right? So sometimes you, or you get like the Beethoven Misa Solemnis. As far as I know, that was never, maybe it was used at a mass sometime. I, 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 but the point being is that these are great standalone works of art. They're sacred, and so far as they do con convey sacred truth, maybe they're not liturgical, though. And so I think more, more between sacred and secular, we can make more of a distinction between uh, sacred music in general and liturgical music more in particular, music that is appropriate for the liturgies the same kind of time. Now, if it got so secular that it got indistinguishable, and this is what happened at the end of the 19th century with some of the operatic stuff, it got indistinguishable between what was sung at the, I mean, Vespers were taking intermissions for goodness sakes, when you're actually taking an intermission in Vespers, you know you've jumped the shark, right? You know you've crossed the line into operatic music that probably should not be admitted into the sacred genre, right? So it's a fine line, but when it becomes so secular and so just workaday and just something that you would hear like in an elevator or, you know, on the street corner or whatever, is, is it really trying to draw our hearts towards heaven? It might be drawing us together, but is it drawing it towards heaven? Maybe it is. Maybe it is just to begin with, but you need something else. Sorry, it was a long kind of all over answer. And uh, this is our final question as we approach one hour. Um, you mentioned Monteverdi as a composer of opera. Could you mention types of music that influenced or were influenced by sacred music? Uh, oh, and if they influenced each other? Yeah. I guess that's the question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I kind of answered that in that last answer. That certainly, all the way through sacred music, you have, there's always been a distinction between sacred and secular music, but at the same time, they influence each other. I mean, you see this even in the music, right, the St. Louis Jesuits in the 70s. A lot of that sounds like the folk music you play around the campfire, right? Uh, they could be completely secular. Uh, and, you know, um, 
the, the sing of the Lord's goodness, right? Sing of the Lord's goodness. That's the same as Dave Brubeck's take five. Da -da 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 right? So uh, there's always been a crossover and influence one of the other. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing though. What, it, it, this is where it takes a real artistry to say like, okay, when are we crossing the line? When are we getting so theatrical or so operatic they're now distracting from the mystery? when we're just making it a show, when we're making it just about entertainment. It should draw the senses in, right? So there is a, there is a theatrical element about it. I mean, that, that it draws us in. I mean, there's something theatrical, if you will, about a church building, right? But it doesn't draw you into a nice show. It draws you into the ultimate ground of being, right? So the end is different. And it also helps make us saints. I mean, for goodness sakes, right? And so if you have music that's kind of denigrating, if you have music that's just sort of just a fun style to dance around to versus music that's going to make me think, oh my gosh, I got to think about the origin and, and the end of my life. One of the great uh, thing, right, greatest parts of this, um, I have a friend who's a musicologist who works on Requiem music, music for the dead. And uh, that's one of the most profound topics um, because this is music that really mediates between life and death, like the ultimate mysteries of the world and can mediate between good and evil and things like this. And especially um, in COVID times, and when we see a lot of death and we see anger people, and I've turned a lot to the Requiem tradition, um, to the Mass of the Dead tradition, to really sort of, sort of help make sense of things. Um, and of course the scriptures make sense of things, but music adds another dimension that the spoken word can't even get to. So brothers and sisters, I really hope tonight, I know it's uh, 6.30, um, any of you who are my buddies, you can uh, contact me. Brian, is there a way that people can contact me or I can send out my, I'm on, I'm on social media. You can contact me on Facebook. By the way, Facebook doesn't let you have um, father as a title, uh, which is unfortunate. So I put it first in, in Spanish, padre, James Moore, but they kicked me off because they know Spanish. They don't know Latin. So I have my title as pater, James Junipero Moore, right? So if you look up James Moore Potter, if you, the Latin word for father, you find me on Facebook. And also I'm on Instagram under the same thing. So God bless you. There it is right now. Heidi just put it up to everyone there. Potter James Junipero Moore uh, is my full religious name. Uh, so as we close out tonight, my hope and my prayer for all of you is really that you take some time to listen to beautiful things. Take some time to look at beautiful art, to visit a beautiful church if you can find a church that's open, to sit in some silence, and then to listen to some real sacred music, to great works of art, that it draws you together with times past, with the church and her meditation upon the word of God throughout 2000 years, but also helps draw you and your loved ones towards God to become saints. Because apart from that in the end, apart from getting to heaven, nothing else much really matters. And we've really got to look at it this day. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless and keep you May he send his angels to shine upon you. May he send the Holy Spirit upon you. May you be freed from all fear, from all anxiety, from all worry. And above all, may you and your family be great saints. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you all.